For those of you who don't know me, I'm Kevin Ciabatti. I chair the design team. Um, and Eric Wiley back there chairs the capital campaign team. And our, our teams together have been working on uh, this plan for over a year. Um, I'm going to keep this brief because we want to make sure that everybody has a chance to see the presentation. Uh, but I do want to say it's been a journey of over, like I say, 12 months of working on the facility assessment and master planning. It's been an exciting process. Um, our architects have guided us through this journey. So, one, I want to welcome you all, but I also want to welcome them here today as well. And they're going to introduce themselves here in a second. Um, this, all this work that we've done culminated in today's presentation, so we're very excited to be here to provide this information to the congregation. Um, there's a lot of things we still have left to do, of course, and this is sort of a, um, an information meeting today to, to look at all the work that we've done and to kind of explain the process that we've gone through over the last 12 months. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Marty Johnson and Ken Johnson. And although they're both named Johnson, we had this discussion early on, they are not related. So um, it's very exciting. Uh, they're from Straka Johnson Architects out of Dubuque, so I'm going to turn it over to them. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Yep. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, well, I'd like to uh, thank all of you for allowing us to come into your church this morning and talk about a few things. As Kevin mentioned, we've uh, uh, gotten together as a group. Uh, um, Pastor Paul first reached out to me last summer and started a dialogue, and we had our first formal meeting in October. But it's been a... Uh, um, uh, a great journey together, and so this is sort of a, a point in that process, and um, we have a lot of things to talk about this morning uh, in terms of what we've done, where, we're, where we've been, what we've kind of pulled together. Uh, a couple of things we're not going to talk about this morning. We're not going to get into the costs right now. We have started to look at that at the committee level. But we felt that that was another reach out to you uh, at the next session. So we want to really talk about this morning was really uh, the process and where we've uh, where we've come to date. So uh, as, as Kevin had mentioned, uh, uh, Ken and I, uh, we've worked together for about 30 years. We're based in Dubuque. Um, and I've got another associate in my office that's been helping us, Benjamin Beard. But there's been about 12 or 13 church members on our committee. Uh, we've, we've met uh, roughly about every three weeks or so. Uh, so we've had about 12 or 13 meetings over the course of our process uh, to where we brought it today. Uh, <clears throat> what we did was um, there was uh, different things in the past have been worked. You, um, all of you have worked a lot uh, so far on this situation. But what we did was we took a little different spin. And so uh, what we did was we took a step back and we really felt your overall facilities need to be assessed in terms of what do you have for needs. And then from a master planning standpoint, what are your wants? And so one of the things that had occurred in the past relative to um, uh, studies that you'd done before, uh, the studies were it's sort of like a book. Um, you have 10 chapters in a book. And what those previous studies uh, kind of looked at was maybe chapters 7, 8, and 9. What we did was we tried to step back and say, look, we need to look at the whole book. We need to look at all the chapters in the book. Because what happens if you focus on just a few chapters and other things can kind of change the course of what the outcome. And a little bit of what Pastor talked about today in terms of the ending. So a little bit of a um, similarity in terms of that situation. But right. So what we did, we started by evaluating all the different uh, existing um, studies. We did an information gathering. We started looking at all your original documents, uh, the original drawings, uh, how the buildings were put together, uh, what the previous studies had done through time, you know, what they had um, uh, identified in the process and, and different inputs that uh, the congregation had given. Then what we did was we started to identify possible solutions and then started to formulate that into a process going forward. So some of the solutions we're going to share with you today are really a culmination of many solutions we shared with the committee. So we look at several different designs, we critique them, throw darts at them, talk about them, and then uh, so what we're sharing today is kind of a, a, um, a little bit of a evolution of that whole process. And a lot of our work too is uh, compiling previous studies into one holistic study, as Marty said. Lovely Lane isn't just the sanctuary, and Lovely Lane isn't just the children's weekday ministries. Lovely Lane is all of us. It's the congregation. It's what we do. It's our ministry here. And so what we wanted to do was bring it all together to, in a master plan to see where we want to go with things. But 
at the same time look back at things like roofs and mechanical units and things that have failed and that continue to fail and make sure that there's an overarching plan to address all of it and to create a road map on how to move forward. So one of the first things we did was we looked at how did this building uh, evolve relative to what we have today. And the red here is what was originally built in 1965. So about 53 years ago, uh, when this church was first formed, uh, the fellowship hall and the restroom block what was, what was initially built in 65. Um, and then it went about uh, some period of time later where their main worship, the sanctuary, was built in 73. That's the, uh, that's the blue. So he started with the fellowship hall and the restrooms. Then um, the uh, sanctuary was built with uh, some support areas. And then in 91, uh, there was two uh, additions. Uh, the initial uh, block for um, uh, uh, classrooms and for uh, additional education was done in 91. And then an entryway was put on at that same time. And then in 2002 uh, was when the final addition was put on relative to the other entryway, more at the west end of the property, and, uh, and some of the additional, uh, additional classrooms. And the colors are beautiful, uh, but there's, these were individual solutions. Uh, the, there wasn't a real homogenous uh, uh, evolution of the plan, if you will. And so... To a point, the 2002 edition is the only part of our building that's sprinkled. Well, as you can see, that's a lot of building. And the current codes would say this building should be sprinkled. This building should have other fire protection, life safety uh, engagements. And uh, one of the things that we're here to do is also help you see the whole picture with the building, how to bring it together and make it the most safe, the most secure, and the most worshipful, worshipful space we can. So what we did was from there we started to look at that assessment, uh, facility assessment needs, and we started to look at all the mechanicals. We interviewed all the vendors that have been working on the building in the last 10 years. We talked to the tradespeople. We met them on site. We talked to them via email and phone multiple times and really tried to get, create an, uh, an age timeline of all the equipment that facilitates the building, what's been replaced, and, and what is in the near term and uh, in longer term going to need to be replaced. So what we're trying to do is create a longer timeline of where your liability is going forward in terms of uh, replacement of, of different uh, pieces of equipment and, and what the age is and the conditions of each of those things. The other thing we started to look at was the site situation how the parking lot works, the circulation, the flow, all the different site issues, uh, and then any kind of uh, prescribed improvements from there to create kind of an action plan that could be really presented to the trustees. So the trustees have a document going forward uh, in terms of, okay, what are our liabilities here? Um, how do we, what do we know, what has to be done? You know, what's priority, what should be done first, and how much is this all going to cost, and how do we budget forward? So that's a little bit what the uh, facilities assessment um, does. You know, when you turn 87 years old, surprises are a good thing on your birthday. When you're running a building, surprises with your mechanical systems and some of the other things are not such good things. So what we did was here we just started to look at different pieces in terms of, of uh, areas throughout the building, in terms of snapshots of different equipment, different ages. So what we did is we created schedules of all the equipment, the ages of them, so then you can kind of start to see what's the oldest equipment and what's going to come, uh, has to be replaced sooner versus those, the equipment that's been the most recent. Those are kind of down at the bottom of the list, and they wouldn't uh, have to be replaced uh, you know, as much in the near term. How do we build upon what works well, and how do we... Uh... Uh, replace what doesn't work so well. Then we did the same thing with the site situation in terms of traffic flow, uh, and the stormwater issues, um, how does stormwater run off the site, um, the green space, um, and uh, you know one of the things on here was the retaining walls in terms of the condition of the retaining walls, and it's great to hear that, uh, that some of that work was even occurred yesterday in terms of some of the volunteer work. So those are some of the things we started to identify on this assessment needs uh, review. So then from that, we started to establish um, the existing um, building envelope, 
um, and, and existing building surveys. So again, we looked in more detail, so we started to add more color to each of these. Um, there's windows that are originally to the original 1965 building, they're wood windows. Some of those are rotting and need to be replaced. Uh, there's issues with siding throughout the building, um, other, other uh, elements, uh, issues with some doors, things like that. So we started to identify all these points and then started to put costs relative to what each of these things are um, going forward. And then did the same thing with the overall um, building usage. One of the things we encountered, for instance, in the 1965 is that although cosmetically the bathrooms look great, uh, it's all served by galvanized pipe, which was very prevalent in the mid-60s. The problem with 50-year-old uh, galvanized pipe is it rots out from the inside out. And so our piping to our restrooms are all uh, to a point where they've almost got to have to be totally redone and taken apart and repiped. Hmm which unfortunately is, is an issue in a lot of 50s and 60s building because of this galvanized uh, piping material that was used. So that was one of the pieces that we uh, started to identify as well. And one of the things we wanted to be sure to identify is what in the building works well, what doesn't work well, as I said, build on what does work well, but so that we don't get surprised as we go on, as we start to see the vision come to life and have to take a step back and replace a roof, for example, which recently happened. So what we really strive to do was take a look at all of those component pieces of the existing building and say, this is a useful life, this is uh, in good condition, this is uh, maybe uh, needing to be replaced and use that as a backdrop for information to give to the trustees, but then also to inform how we would uh, reconfigure the building if we could. So things like exterior siding around the building that's failing, uh, existing mechanical equipment in certain spots that are more aged and, the, and, and failing, um, the, the piping issues in those restrooms, as, uh, as I had mentioned, other, um, er, other areas, the windows that are, are for the most part in the fellowship area that are, that are failing that need to be replaced at some point in time. But another function of this that you don't really see on this plan is that uh, to get from one side of the building to the other side of the building, uh, uh, there's some uh, mixing of uses. The ch children's weekday ministry occurs on a couple of different levels in the building, and it shares corridors and walkways and entrances. And uh, that's part of the facility assessment that we also looked at. So that, as Ken had mentioned, some of those things that start are, are code-driven and some are just inclusive type items that you want to be able to be welcoming to all the people that are visiting. And so things like ADA and, and handicap accessibility um, in terms of issues um, with the restrooms, uh, other pieces, the... the um, the addition that was put in 2002 actually had an area for a future elevator that never got established, that staircase that comes down and how that works in the circulation um, area. So there's a lot of issues r relative to um, circulation throughout the building for, for ADA, uh, and as well as some um, ADA code um, egress issues in the building. So taking all these things in terms of what are our existing liabilities throughout the building first, and then from there, start to apply our master planning wants. So we've got our uh, assessment parts that are sort of needs. And these are things we have right now that we have to address. And then our master planning going forward equals the wants. So uh, by establishing the needs first, it can, it can do a little bit of twofold because then we can start to identify solutions that can help address the, the assessment needs of the building at the same time possibly address the uh, master planning going forward. And uh, when you can get two to uh, uh, a solution that solves both of those simultaneously, then it's a kind of a win-win situation. Mm -hmm. So kind of started from master planning in the site survey, uh, we, we looked at um, the condition of the lot, resurfacing, uh, the circulation, and some of the other areas that affect in terms of how that affects the stormwater. You know, there's a rain garden on the west side, uh, but a lot of the water that's coming off the lot is not being directed to that rain garden, so it's not really being used to, uh, to its complete uh, um, uh, merits. Uh, there's other things that are coming relative to ADA parking. The handicapped parking doesn't meet code. It's in a part of the lot that's too steep. Overall, the lot is really graded too steep, and so we had looked at solutions to say, well, what if we just regraded the whole lot and took all that grade down and made it more level, but then we looked at the cost side of that situation. Mm -hmm. So then we looked at other solutions to say, well, are there other ways we can solve this without spending uh, tons of money on regrading? And so that's kind of one of 
the pathways we've looked at. Also looked at the idea of a covered drop-off, something that could be used for more inclement weather, uh, both from a safety standpoint as well as ease of convenience. That seemed to come out of some of these evaluations and sort of a, of a, of a want. Throughout the process, uh, we tried to make sure that uh, all of the wants were, we, we listened to all the ideas, but as good stewards of the resources here, we knew that we can't do everything that we would like to do. And so we tried to uh, formulate priorities of the things that could make the final list. Uh, and, and these are some of the winners here, uh, things that uh, were really recurring themes that uh, really should be addressed if we can address them. Well, one of the things we learned through the course of these many meetings with, the, with your committees is that the culture of this, of this church. And so you're very practical. And so it's a situation where we're not going to go down a road of doing things that are that are not really meeting your practical needs. That needs to be paramount and first. So those are all things we start to look at. So we're not trying to gild the lily here with anything. We're trying to make things very practical. At the same time, if you're doing something and it can, it can make something more beautiful, uh, well, then that has some, some positive merit as well. <laughs> So from that um, uh, sort of site situation, the, the concept we came up with, rather than regrading the entire parking lot, was to actually rotate the parking orientation 90 degrees and rotate the parking uh, in terms of orientation, changed a lot of things. It also allowed um, a series of handicapped stalls in a part of a lot that are adjacent to the entryway that would allow a uh, meeting, uh, meeting code. The other thing was the function of... Uh, of Pierce Elementary and how there's a lot of uh, um, traffic on the site during the weekday in terms of parental pickup and drop off that isn't really your mission, but it's sort of evolved into it. And there's also some children that, that are dealing with the children's ministry that kind of come into play. So how do we deal with safely that drop off and pick up that's occurring for the for the um, uh, adjacent elementary school? Um, and how do we deal with uh, stormwater uh, runoff and things like that? So what we've done here is actually rotated the parking uh, now east and west rather than north and south, created the possibility of a pedestrian access right, right through the lot uh, safety, created a um, a loop drop-off area like this, so the traffic could come in. You actually created a defined drop-off lane for cars that could stage here, so the children coming from the elementary school could come out and be picked up at this point, and then uh, safely egress off the site um, and not create other conflicts. We looked at um, ideas of possibly developing more parking on the west. We even looked at creating some circulation on this side. Those were all eliminated because of creating too much uh, elimination of green space. And they weren't consistent um, with your mission, and so we, we took those off the table. The reorientation of the parking lot here is there's a net zero change in the number of parking stalls. So that was one of our criterion going forward is that we wouldn't lose any parking stalls. Um, we had also looked at the play area and where's the play area located right now versus you know, where does it maybe want to be re relocated relative to tr uh, movement of children, uh, given the fact that all those support areas are on the west end of the building and the, uh, and the play area is actually on the east side. So we looked at the idea of moving that uh, at the end of the day, given all the other situations, uh, collectively it seemed like uh, keeping it in its existing location was, was really the, mm -hmm. the best situation. So the other part that came into here from the site plan was a sense of arrival to the building, uh, especially on Sunday. And so the idea of maybe covered uh, portraiture or some kind of an entryway, that site solution started to lead into other things that came into the building as well. So one of the things we looked at was creating um, a diagonal actually through the building, uh, which culminated in how uh, the layout is with inside the sanctuary, but at the same time, it creates a, a new architectural element right as, you, as soon as you come onto the site. So we're proposing some type of a covered entryway with kind of a diagonal thrust that would create a sense of arrival here, clearly knowing that that is the sense of, of entrance for the church, still keeping the secondary entrance, but this is very much played down relative to the uh, ch uh, children's ministry care areas on the west side. So this um, architect architectural element on the outside really is driven by an interior situation uh, going through um, inside the building. So as we kind of started to look at the wants on the existing building, 
Um, there was a, one of the main things was obviously the um, orientation of the worship area and the um, sanctuary, but also possibly trying to centralize some of these um, uh, different functions as well as during, dealing with safety and security. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the big things now, especially when we do schools and things like that, is the, the sense of arrival and control in the children's areas during the day and having a single point of entry that can be secure, can be closed off from the rest of the building, and that's something that we really uh, are kind of lacking right now. So security and safety was a, a big point. Um, that enhanced entrance and experience to the narthex and how the narthex presently works. The idea of creating a threshold from the narthex into the worship space, into the holy space. And right now, we really don't have that threshold. That threshold is homogenous between the front door and, and here in the sanctuary. So we wanted to create that uh, sense of, of rival and threshold into the, um, into the sanctuary space. Uh, improved nursery, a um, few, few of the other things we talked about. So what we did was we took the existing plan, and what this is, is this is the existing layout, and we started to color code it relative to function. <laughs> And what this does is it kind of starts to tell us how functions are sometimes intertwined together as opposed to collective together. So you know, one of the things we can look at when we see the West End is darker blue are areas for uh, children's ministries, but it's also intertwined with other administration areas and other support functions for the congregation. So what it does is it makes for a very difficult way to, to segment and zone the building. And what this doesn't show is that some of the children's week, weekday ministries is also downstairs. So you have to go up the stairs, down the stairs, communicate back and forth into the gathering space in the fellowship hall, which is also kind of the main path to get from one end of the building to the other. And so these are the kind of things that the color-coded plan helps us really uh, look at. Well, um, and it's kind of mentioned in terms of, of the fellowship hall, and, and if we remember back, fellowship hall was the first built, uh, first uh, uh, addition, first space built on campus. Is that um, this is a twenty three thousand square foot building, but it lacks overall central circulation. There's no way to get from one end of the building to the other through any kind of corridor system. What happened during the course of these multiple five additions is that. Uh, existing spaces became corridors. So right now your fellowship hall, as you start to look at this, to get from this end of the building to this end of the building is you have to go through the fellowship hall. And so what happens is because of the vi uh, vitality of this congregation and the amount of ministries you've got going on, you can have three different things going on in an evening right now in this building. And what happens is that people have to go through the fellowship hall when there's functions going on to get from one end to the other, whether it's the restrooms, uh, the other area, back to this area. So that was one of the things that we started to identify that's sort of a major weakness. It's just came about through the evolution of 53 years of multiple additions, is there's no central circulation space in the building. And you know, is, can we accomplish that, and how do we do that? So that was one of the um, uh, uh, main deficiencies we saw. Uh, the other thing was a sprinkling of the zonal use in the building, both vertically and horizontally in the building. So how can we reorganize that into something that's a little bit more uh, focused and, uh, and efficient. And so this was um, started to take what we talked about in the master plan of how we start to pull things together. So this is sort of an overlay on top of that older map. And first off, what we were doing is actually creating um, a, a new organizational pattern to the sanctuary. And uh, this is a little bit reminiscent because I think this room was actually laid out this way years ago. Uh, and so what we're proposing is that uh, the chancel and the whole area being rotated from the north wall to the northeast corner. This so, corner. Or I'm sorry, southeast corner. So we create this diagonal through the space. Um, one of the things uh, also talked about was this, this threshold of walking in the sacred space and how do you do that. And so after researching even photographs of when this building was built, we realized that the corner of this building right here, which kind of drove everybody around before, actually is non-structural. 
And so by having that allowed that we could actually take out this corner of that structure underneath where the organ pipes are at, all of a sudden allowed for a different flow. And that's where this diagonal approach kind of came into play in terms of coming into the, uh, into the worship space. So by reorganizing, reorganizing the um, sanctuary space, um, also heard a lot about even details and past studies of the seating arrangements. Some folks like chairs, some folks like pews, a uh, combination back and forth. Our seating capacity, we don't want to reduce seating capacity. If anything, we want to enhance seating capacity. Those are all criteria we looked at. So using those goals, we, we also, right now you're about 275 seats in its present arrangement. In this layout right now, we've got about 390, 395. So we pick up about 20 seats um, in, in normal use from this, from this area. So um, by reorganizing the sanctuary space, rotating the chancel to the corner, uh, applying music into this area, the choir bells into this area, center area possibly, um, pews and then side areas could be um, individual chairs with um, taking fireside and making that a more defined multi-purpose room with better acoustical separation here at the same time this still can be opened up and be used for worship space. Then that leads us to the narthex. Um, very, learn about your culture. It's a very welcoming uh, congregation. Um, the idea of fireside kind of kind of struck on us in terms of kind of something that pulls together as a very welcoming device. So what we proposed here was a, a narthex that's very much expanded. It's actually taking out um, all the existing administration offices and allowing a front door now to come in through this covered portraiture directly into a nice large narthex where people can mill about, congregate, uh, converse, uh, welcome, have fellowship, uh, with the possibility of actually using a center fireplace as a wayfinding device. So it's a four-sided <laughs> fireplace, kind of fireside on steroids, if I could, mm -hmm. uh, a little bit. But um, taking that culture of what you have and carrying it forward, because it is a little bit of an imagery and branding of what this church is. Mm -hmm. And so we said, well, let's take it, even, step it up even a little bit further. So that is an idea of maybe a, a four-sided fireplace, an idea of a kind of a coffee bar and supporting that function. Uh, we looked at expanding and improving the kitchen space uh, in that area. What this was suggesting is along this exterior wall, which was the original 65 building, we've created a corridor. So now we've got a corridor from the narthex all the way to the west, all the way through to the children's wing at the, at the west end. Now this area then can, can um, allow access into the fellowship hall. Functions can still occur in the fellowship hall and people can still circulate east to west through the building. Um, creating new restrooms here that have to be repiped anyway because of the piping issues. Um, we've moved the library, which was in this corner. We've moved the library now kind of front and center, more approachable off the narthex. We've created a, a, a children's uh, nursery kind of cry area uh, adjacent off of this area as well. And then we've kind of bundled the um, uh, children's area into uh, larger, uh, uh, well-manipulated spaces for two-year-old, three-year-old, and four-year-old. Brought them all on the same floor, all together from a safe standpoint. So when we talk about safety and security, um, we would still have this western entrance, but a western entrance that could be they could serve not only the um, church administration function in this area, but also a whole uh, children's uh, support wing that has its own circulation. So now this area can be all locked down and separated and, and not have to worry about uh, crossover of security or, or safety. Very um, secure. Uh, you'll also notice that we're moving the stair inboard um, so that the stair can be used from the general public in the corridor side without having to go into the children's weekday ministry side. So then we took this, this sort of conceptual sketches to a little bit more defined. So this is sort of that same plan with a little bit more definition. So we've um, um, uh, done a defi more of a defined work in the sanctuary space, a fireside room that would still be expandable to worship, the overall narthex with a four-sided fireplace, uh, a children's nursery area, uh, and this at this point, the library, then a circulation pattern that comes down and goes back out another entrance. So we've got kind of a Sunday entrance here and then a weekday entrance here 
uh, that then the green is all the church administration functions all pulled together. Uh, they still would have ac good access off the library for meeting spaces. Um, and then the, the two, three, and four-year-olds all uh, set up with administration support at that area. Uh, a new elevator that's actually double-sided. So one side would go onto the children's side, the other side would go into the circulation side uh, in that existing shaft way that's already built. Um, and then creating a new staircase um, down in that area. Um, One of the things that we found uh, and learned and we're really happy to find out is that Lovely Lane is a flourishing community. It's a vibrant community and that there aren't places in the building that are just underused and underutilized except for potentially the lower level that we couldn't get to before. So now we're including putting an elevator in so all of the buildings are accessible. But it also meant that we couldn't just reduce offices or we couldn't just cut part of the uh, fellowship hall. What we have is a, a small addition going onto the north side of the building, but what we're using is the existing exterior walls as a benchmark for that addition. So um, this, print, this slide doesn't come across real strong, but this is starting to look at some of the details um, in, uh, on the lower level. And uh, some of the things we're looking at is bringing the elevator down to that lower level so it is accessible, uh, creating a, a new restroom down here possibly with a shower so that other ministries could be used in terms of uh, even uh, uh, overnight situations where people would want to use a shower back when the flood occurred in, in 2008 and some of the needs and, and desires to have that kind of function seem to kind of come out of the play relative to the past uh, surveys and the dialogue we had through our meetings. So proposing a um, restroom down there with showers, um, a new expanded staircase that really opens up uh, the flow and actually introducing um, some skylights over top of that staircase. So natural light uh, follows you down that staircase. Um, but for the most part, in the lower levels, uh, there wasn't a lot of other physical changes other than that. We were proposing, again, to carry a sprinkler system throughout the whole building. Um, from a safety standpoint, we really felt that that's kind of paramount, that the whole building should be um, sprinkled uh, on, on both, both levels. And what we're finding then with the lower level is, uh, and actually if you go another slide, by installing the elevator, now we have a zone that we can use for religious education that's not off base, that's available to everyone that you can get to, and uh, is not also, by the way, part of the children's weekday ministry. So it's uh, a bona fide religious education and ministries zone. That can be used both during the week as well as uh, on, on, on Sundays and on days of worship. Exactly. Um, so this started to lead us. We've got a, a couple elements here. We've got a little bit of a video that we're going to kind of share with you here as we close out of this PowerPoint. But we've got some still images here of what this was sort of proposing in terms of architecturally. One of the so, things we haven't mentioned yet is that one of the visions for Lovely Lane is as a, 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 a church on a hill, a beacon on a hill. And uh, in order to do that, we, uh, we took that sort of symbolism and created a literal lantern on top of the sanctuary here that would shine natural light to the outdoors and also let natural light into the indoors. And that you start to pick up in some of these images here. So what that really, again, starts with a sanctuary space. And so this is an item that we talked about this space, the fact that there's no natural light in this worship area. At the same time, uh, there is a little bit of, of the stained glass that occurs uh, at the connection points at either side. So those are things we want to carry forward. But you know, the other challenge was you know, the idea of introducing natural light into this place, at the same time not creating a conflict with glare and things like that. We've done this at a, in a few other installations before, and it's really come across... Uh, extremely well. So this was one of the things we proposed to the committee was actually uh, taking a, a lantern uh, with large uh, overhangs uh, that would sit on top of the main uh, space so you'd see it uh, at, at different points uh, from that direction. So that was one of the things we looked at that could be driven from uh, in, any of the, the uh, um, programs that could work or uh, projects to work around the uh, the sanctuary space. The other part then is some, this idea of a covered portraiture that would come out at you um, on the north side as a greeting point to create some uh, uh, cover uh, underneath and then create a new um, entrance point that again is all di on diagonal right to the point of worship. Um, inside so as you space. enter the parking lot 
this is the focal point and there's no question about where you want to go. So this is kind of le then leading you into the narthex, uh, into that space, which is right on diagonal with the uh, main worship space. And then kind of going back to this uh, uh, floor plan situation, um, as you're coming in at that diagonal, uh, you've got this large uh, uh, common narthex space with the possibility of a, of a, a, a center fireplace. Um, so as we look at that in a little bit more detail, um, we come into that uh, off the uh, covered porcature, um, into an airlock entryway, and into a then kind of a roundabout narthex with the possibility of the center fireplace. You've got access directly to the library off of here so that in might night meetings or other things, this could even be an extension of fellowship at times. Um, other direction with coats. Um, this is going into fireside, and this is going into the uh, nursery area. And then, then going through uh, uh, stained glass art doors that would lead you directly into the, into the sanctuary space uh, on either side, and then putting kind of AV um, in this AV support kind of back in this area as you come, come around. This entrance then could then come down the corridor alongside where the fellowship is at, sort of a coffee support area. Um, you, you can really see the threshold between the common and the sacred space here in, and in this photo as well. So you've come, you've come through the airlock entryway. You're kind of looking uh, straight towards the worship area. So these uh, uh, glass art doors are going into the worship area. Uh, this is going into the fireside and then um, into the uh, uh, children's area. And then uh, this is just out of the focus here, but that kind of a, a coffee um, support um, uh, welcoming station to the to the right side, and then it's just, just kind of rotating back, uh, looking at that same area. The fellowship hall is back in this area. Uh, worship and sanctuary is to my is to the left of the photograph. And looking at the main sanctuary space, so as you come through the narthex um, into this area, these are the two existing. Uh, structural columns that need to remain, but everything else is peeled away. So it kind of opens up that whole corner of the plan. So now as you come um, into the uh, worship area, you have that D mark, you have that threshold of stepping into more uh, sacred holy space from the, from the narthex. And um, keeping the center of, of the body of the space with, with pews, possibly, uh, and then using the side kind of transepts for uh, individual uh, chairs and seating. Um, with the main chancel at this point, um, choir um, along in this area, uh, main music with organ and piano, and then the bell choir um, nested over to here. So you basically got all those uh, music and oratory functions occurring across the, uh, the front sides. Um, this wall then can open up in terms of go back into a pocket. So this all could be expanded to add additional seating into the main uh, sanctuary. And then this is the uh, 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 kind of nursery uh, cry area as support off that same same area. Then we've uh, created some expansion in this area for the kitchen and then uh, established choir back in this area so it's adjacent to the uh, uh, sanctuary space and then that corridor that leads down along the fellowship hall with, uh, with new <coughs> restrooms at that point. <coughs> So this is inside the, the sanctuary space. You've come through the doors, make, looking at the main chancel. This is the, uh, the lantern that we're proposing, allowing that natural light and with new lighting and floating cloud ceilings, keeping all the existing wood um, and structures, overall ambiance um, uh, as, as it is, but really reorientating the, uh, the organization of the room. But again, it's, it, uh, I, I think this is how it almost was originally it, uh, I think 20, 25 years ago, how the space was used. This is standing more um, uh, up at the other end, so this would be uh, uh, sort of Pastor Scott's view, looking uh, looking back uh, at the um, at the uh, uh, side entries. This area can open up to fireside on this side, um, and then the bell choir would be off to the left here, and then. Uh, Music is to the uh, is to the right, and you can again start to pick up this lantern effect with a natural light coming into the center part of the room. <clears throat> this is a little bit of a uh, just looking at the central part of the plan, um, looking kind of southerly. So we've got this uh, new diagonal entrance coming in through the narthex. 
Now we've actually got a, a circulation space down through the building and coming back this way to the weekday entrance. Uh, the original 65 building had all these stone pillars that you see on the outside of the building. They actually occurred in these areas as well. Those are all covered up. Some of them are in closets, some are in other areas. So our proposal is to actually peel back that material and show the original stone columns that are already there uh, to create kind of a, a really nice rhythm down this corridor uh, that would allow for circulation space. So now you can uh, circulation space is not going through Fellowship Hall. It has its own uh, defined definition. You can enter the Fellowship Hall at multiple points, uh, area for uh, new restrooms that meet all ADA with all new piping and controls. And then this area is in uh, church administration. So that weekday entrance, you could come into this area and you could go to the left um, that would go lead into church administration. So you've got good sight lines and control over this area. These would be support offices, pastor's office, conference rooms, other support areas. Uh, and then this could also then lead into the library space. The library then becomes a nice meeting room for church administration as well, right off of the same administration core. And going back to that weekday entrance um, for uh, children's ministries, um, this door then would lead to children's ministries. So now you've got a reception control for all this area, and now its own circulation and the three rooms, the two, three, and four-year-old rooms are all together, each having restrooms, good definition. So now we've got a good lockdown secured line all the way through at this point. This would be the new uh, double-sided elevator. So actually you could come from the children's side or from the corridor side into that elevator. Uh, that would lead to the lower level. From a security point of view, we really want anyone to be in the children's weekday ministry area to be intentionally there. They're supposed to be there, and we control, can control who goes in there. Uh, then um, this is a new staircase, so it's kind of more of an open staircase, possibility of some skylights coming into it that, that occurs at the corner of this circulation corridor. So now folks can come and come lead into this space and go down the stairs immediately without affecting children's um, uh, areas separately, or they can come down the corridor and then, and then use the elevator uh, without going to that or vice versa uh, in terms of that circulation. Uh, and that's just, just a little bit of a blow up of that center corridor area of, of coming in off that airlock on the weekday entrance, leading it down to the um, uh, across by fellowship and this being the new staircase to the lower level and this being the new elevator in the existing uh, existing shaft. And these are just a couple little um, images of that looking at the staircase leading down with with uh, fellowship to the um, to the left and then this door then leads to um, uh, children's ministry areas. This is standing kind of at the landing of the stair looking back towards the front. So church administration offices are here to the right and, uh, and children's areas to the left and the exterior door straight straight ahead. Uh, <clears throat> this is just a blow up of that same area uh, for the, the two, three, and four year olds. Uh, we do have to meet uh, Iowa licensing requirements in terms of, of um, dealing with child care areas and things like that. So we're kind of meeting all the updated codes and requirements for, for these spaces to uh, safely and appropriately uh, give uh, service to those children. So that um, kind of leads us back to the overall plan. We just, um, we've got a little bit of a video here that we just wanted to show that uh, maybe uh, helps the process um, in terms of um, where things are at. What we've done is we've tried to create, we've created a staging phasing plan to this so that um, we don't know if this is something that the congregation would want to tackle in one fell swoop or this may have to occur over 10 years. So if it's a 10-year situation um, and you can't do it all at one time, how can we do this in implemented steps? So it's sort of like remodeling your house. Um, you know, are you, you need to do your kitchen, your bathrooms, your mechanical system, and sometimes the money just isn't there. You have to do them room by room. Well, at the same time, when you do it room by room, now you're living through many years of renovation at the same time in your cost situations. But that's the reality of how we all have to be in stewards of our own financial resources. So this is just a little bit of a, um, uh, let me go back to the, <clears throat> so this is a, a, sort of an overview looking down at the um, 
from the site relative to just on a Google map and place to kind of the, the model on top of that. Um, so as we come in the drive, this is that kind of covered portraiture situation that kind of um, identifies you um, as you a diagonal. It's kind of that thrust is pulling you right into the space. And then with the idea of actually the lantern uh, also rotated to align with that 45 degree uh, within the worship space. So we're kind of dropping down um, onto um, onto the level of the parking lot. Um, and then now we're kind of going into the space, approaching potentially the doors for an entryway. Kind of going through that airlock. Now we're greeted within, within the narthex. So this being um, uh, a much larger space, you know, 125 people could be in this space at times before or after services, so there, there's room for people to mull about all the way around. Um, the idea of um, uh, using stonework, uh, wood, carrying through some of the feelings of the sanctuary space inside that narthex to really create a warm and inviting space. Um, and then with the, uh, the entrances to the worship area beyond, so. So we're kind of swinging around that uh, uh, fireplace area uh, and approaching the worship. Now we've gone through the worship space. We're, we're inside the sanctuary. You can see the overhead, overhead lantern uh, possibly turned at a 45 degree. We've moved the uh, chancel to the, uh, to the corner of the space and then with uh, uh, really support areas of music to both right and left of the space with a center diagonal um, aisle. Kind of swinging around, looking uh, more northerly. Um, you can kind of see where uh, piano and organ may, may be orchestrated at this point. Um, these, these would be uh, uh, fixed panels that would slide back into a pocket uh, to be able to open up uh, fireside at times. Looking back at the other area, so that we've um, kind of clipped Now we're back in the narthex at that point. We're sort of looking down uh, potentially the corridor uh, with fellowship, uh, the idea of using some type of a hospitality support point in terms of a, a coffee bar uh, area that would be adjacent and easily serviced off the kitchen. Uh, and then the restrooms are, are new, uh, restrooms are actually behind these walls here as we lead down that corridor. Now we're kind of going down, starting to go down that quarter. This, as I'd mentioned, these stone pillars are actually originally to the building, and those are there now. They're covered up. So we're proposing to kind of open up those walls, create this corridor system all the way down through here. So fellowship is to the, uh, to the left, and then uh, new restrooms are to the right, and then further down is the uh, church administration offices. This is just inside the fellowship hall, um, really doing uh, minimal work within the fellowship hall. Back to the corridor, or coming down a little bit farther, we're starting to approach where the uh, uh, staircase is at, I'm kind of looking into the children's area. Um, so this would be a new staircase that would lead to the lower level, the possibly natural light uh, filtering into this area, and then the elevator is just to the right of this, this shot. And we rotate it on again. We're at the top of the stairs. The um, church administration is to the right. We're looking back out that uh, weekday uh, entrance to the uh, uh, northwest. And then children's area would be off to the... Um, so we, what we did was, so we came in, we flew around here, came through these doors, we went in this space, we turned around, we came back out, started to go down the hallway, jumped into the fellowship hall, continued on, we're at this landing at the staircase, went back to this area. So that, um, we just thought this type of um, 
of a, of a drawing may help people to kind of help visualize what we're proposing, how it all ties together. So again, um, we shook the box. We looked at all the different aspects. Um, uh, one of the things that we feel our job is is that uh, we need to talk about everything up front because if you do something and three years later somebody comes up and says, well, did you think about this or what about that or uh, how, where are we going to find the money because this is broken, we've sort of failed in our job. So our job is to try to look at all these things up front, look at all the possible solutions, create that master plan along with your um, assessment list of all the different uh, um, uh, liabilities and, and then put it into a, uh, a plan that, that could be implemented either in a multi-phase situation over a period of time or it could be done in a more condensed timeline really based off of um, established of, of where monies are at knowing that we've got to be good stewards and make this as practical as possible. So kind of throw out a lot of different things here. We've been again through 12 or 13 meetings. The committee you know, we meet about two hours each time, so we've had about 25 or 30 hours of meetings. And so sometimes the, as a committee and even as us, we start to look at things and, we, and we've seen it so much that so we kind of know everything. We know a lot of you are coming into something, this is the first time you've seen any of this stuff, and it can be either a little confusing or overwhelming. overwhelming. So, you know, we look to uh, address or answer any of your questions. Um, some things we haven't addressed yet, we haven't thought about it in, in, in real detail. Um, you know, we start out at 30,000 feet, and then you got to get the plane long, you know, closer to the ground. And we're still probably at about 5,000 feet. You know, we can see the airport, we can see the landing strip, we know how to get there, but we're not there yet. So, we, you know, we don't have colors and materials and things like that picked out. Um, so there's a lot of, all kinds of, a lot of things that still have to be addressed. But um, it's been a really fun process. I think we've formed some great relationships with everybody on the committee. And uh, appreciate you know being invited in to, to help with this. So, um, you know, Eric or Kevin, I mean, if there's any things in terms of how you'd like to address conversations this morning in terms of questions or. Um, just as they were, uh, first of all, let's thank these gentlemen for their work. Um, amazing. Um, they have been fantastic to work with. Um, they have really become a part, and I think you can get a sense that they've come to understand us. Um, as you were saying, we're not at the level where we're picking materials, certain layouts. You know, people, people have lots of questions about, well, I do things in the kitchen. What are we going to do in the kitchen? Well, we're not there yet. And when that time comes, all of the people who are involved in the kitchen are going to help decide what that is. Um, so those are a lot of specific things that we don't have yet. We're building the roadmap. Vision. The vision, indeed. How do we want to handle uh, questions? That's the part we hadn't talked about yet, Eric. Yes, I am. We can share with you. I mean, I, I first of all, hear me. Sorry. Sorry. I appreciate everybody's time. I know this was, uh, as everybody said, this is overwhelming, a lot of information. Um, we surely can take questions, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that everybody got a chance to watch the whole presentation first. Um, we can surely, we want to document every question and, and answer them and I think at some point Eric and I were going to create maybe a forum either online or on the website that might even answer them. Um, we are recording this, correct? Is yes. that, so we'll have that documented. I will take notes as, as these gentlemen will tell you. I, I seem to take notes kind of, I take I, everything that's said I think I've written down or at least tried. Um, in the document, there is a document that does exist that have all, has all the meeting minutes in it um, and we try to document as much of that as we've gone on. So. <clears throat> With that, I, I suppose we could open up for questions, and I'm going to probably pass the microphone to Eric so I can write them down as as they're um, as they're quite asked, I guess. So, the, the other thing I think we talked about is if there's written people that have questions, if you could jot them down and email them in, or or however, drop them off at the office, or, or put them in the collection plate in the next couple of weeks. However, you want to convey, convey those, but. Uh, I think it's really important, as, as Kevin had mentioned, to document all these questions because what one person has a question, there could be six other people that have the same question. 
And so when we do it in a process to be able to delineate and, and uh, um, uh, record all that, it, it works really well. The other thing is that um, uh, with media today, it's really easy to ch uh, share information. So, you know, I think it's a goal that we'd like to have this PowerPoint and this video actually on your website or your Facebook page or however you want to. And that way, um, other family members can look at this or other friends that maybe aren't here today. We have a lot of documentation. <laughs> <laughs> We've been collecting a lot of documents. We have a large bound book that has all of the assessments that were done and all the planning that we've done over the last, I've been working on this for about eight years, I think. Um, all the different variations of this plan as things came along. Um, we gave everything to them and they used that to get to where we are. So we have everything. If you're interested in details and where we've been and how we got here, we can share that. Um, take a few questions. There go the I totally love the ideas that you've come up with. I think it's going to be great. Um, I have a couple questions. Storage is a huge issue in this church. We share a lot of space with the children, and we're shoving things everywhere we can get. Have you thought about storage? And um, I saw that there were some things in Fellowship Hall that looked like maybe it was table storage and things, but we need a ton more. And the other thing is, I hope that you're thinking of the sacristy as well. Um, that really needs to be improved as well. There is some space uh, behind choir. The, that open space just to the left of choir on the diagram, if you have your uh, bulletin insert, um, that is replacing the current chair and table storage on the, uh, the north wall of Fellowship Hall. And it's, whenever, whenever these gentlemen moved something, they kept it the same size so that we didn't lose anything. But you're right, we need more. We need more. More storage. Okay, those are all, uh, and that's, uh, some of this is detail, but some of it is core elements of the program, too. So we have to make sure that we've got enough square footage to, in a sense, once we get that level of detail to meet all those requirements. And whether it's creating more storage in that expanded area for the nursery, uh, other, other parts of this is that having an elevator in this building really changes the usage of this building a lot, especially for storage. Now you can move things up and down on carts and do things safely that you can't do right now. So it helps to create the efficiency between the two levels a lot more so than what you presently have. So <clears throat> I think as, as Eric had mentioned, um, going forward in terms of implementation, we would have what we call stakeholder group meetings with each of the different groups, whether it's music, liturgy, uh, 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 administration, uh, children's uh, ministry areas, meeting with each of those groups in real detail to de redefine their uh, program, their needs, and then how does that blend into the overall plan. So um, good, good input. Okay, my question involves the kitchen area. I know you talked about the galvanized pipes in the bathrooms. Do we also have that same situation in our kitchen area? And then second, we also need a corridor on the outside of our building for our children going to Pierce. There is such a flow through that on a daily basis before and after school that's walking through our handicap area. We need to look at that corridor as well. I think the, um, you know, one, one thing that we had struggled a lot with in terms of food service is that food service is really not in the right part of the plan. It should have more outside access where you've got product, soiled, clean coming in and out. It's more buried internal to the plan. So we tried to find, could we actually move it to more of a perimeter area to have better service and access? And, uh, and through the course of designs, um, it, it was driving so many other pieces that we, we kind of uh, said, you know, I think we need to address <coughs> other areas in a different fashion. So. Um, what we're trying to do is, is maintain the square footage and expand the square footage for the kitchen as much as possible. At the same time, identifying equipment needs and other things for that for that function 
um, to occur. The, the circulation space through the building, uh, that's one of the reasons why we really established that whole corridor system on the north side of the fellowship hall was really to enhance and uh, improve that circulation space. Um, so I think the, the whole Pierce function adds another layer of complexity of how those children move safely on campus, both before and after school. So those are things that, that uh, are, are important. And uh, you know, I, I think we need to have more dialogue about it to make sure that our plan is, is meeting all the right criteria. One of the things when we do a plan or do any design, I kind of use the analogy of a pitcher of water. The pitcher of water is our money, typically, or other constraints. Everybody that has a program requirement brings a glass to the table. And we've got to put all the glasses on the table that are needed, and we've got to pour the right amount of water in each one of those glasses. And some have to have more and some have to have less, but at the same time, they're all important. So it's that balancing act of how do we create that right equilibrium between how much water is in each glass versus how much is in the pitcher. You know, it's, well, sometimes it's easy to, oh, just go get another pitcher. Well, that's not, that's easier said than done. So, um, so th that's all the struggle back and forth when we get to this, is try to create that balance when we've got, you know, 10, 12, 15 functions that are occurring in this campus. It's not just about worship, it's all these other functions. They all are important, they're all critical to the mission, but we've got to find the right balance and right priority for each one of those. And so that's kind of what this process is about. Yes. Um, we're still maintaining a, um, um, a very safe, appropriate sidewalk along the north side of the building uh, across that point. But what we are doing is we are bringing some parking up to that because without regrading the parking lot, the only place to get um, code appropriate handicap parking is closer to the building. So from our, our, um, you know, on our site plan drawing, um, we, we still have an east-west sidewalk all the way across that space so that uh, kids and, and, and folks can move safely along the north side of the building, but we have brought handicap parking closer to the building to, to meet those needs as well. Another question back here. Hi, thank you for all you've done. It looks wonderful. Um, my name is Jessica. I work with the youth group, um, the high school youth, and they're currently in the basement. Um, I didn't see a whole lot of information about the basement. My question is, is there going to still be a designated space for the youth that's separate? Um, and maybe what would that look like? The, uh, you know, one of the challenges with the lower level is the lack of handicap accessibility and the awkwardness of that staircase. That staircase, again, we go back and find, you know, realize when the building was built in phases and why the staircase the way it is, that's one of the, the, the challenges. So, what we propose is actually removing that staircase, changing the whole circulation space, adding the elevator. So now we've got a, a, a much more appropriate tie-in between floors. So now the, the spaces that are down there, at the same time, uh, we're going to um, expand some of the rooms and make some of the rooms larger through the course of that reorganization of the circulation. So I think... Um, the space that's down there, I think, is going to be able to be used more effectively. It's going to be more accessible, uh, and it's going to help uh, create more of an integration. One of our concerns is we're trying to get the two, three, and four-year-olds all together on the same floor from a supervision and a safety security standpoint. That was one of the things that we just thought was a little higher priority that we have to achieve. Um, at the same time, we're trying not to expand the building because we've got enough liabilities within the existing building to replace kind of broken and worn out stuff. If we use more of that pitcher of water to build more stuff out beyond it, that's great, but it just, it, it takes a bigger picture. And so we're trying to be cognizant of the money and be as practical to, as we can at the same time fit all these needs. So I, I think the lower level um, uh, in terms of the layouts are going to get enhanced and, and become a lot more efficient than what they are now. When Jessica ref refers to the youth, she's talking about middle school and high school mm -hmm. and that large room that we use down there now. The answer to your question is yes, <laughs> that will still be there. Um, in fact, we've even looked at trying to expand that kitchen area to make that a little more useful down there for those groups. Quick question. 
Um, does the current building code allow an extra dis travel distance to exiting with the sprinkler system installation? Like, I was just concerned with that four-year-old room, the furthest distance, to get to the second exit since you're moving it more east. I wasn't sure with that. Yep. So yep. those of you who don't know, Kevin Siabati, chair of our design team, is the senior building official for the city of Cedar Rapids. All of the uh, people who inspect buildings work for him. And he's been fantastic to have on our committee because when those questions come up, Kevin just looks at it and says, mm -hmm, yeah, you can do that, or no, you can't I, do that. I was so excited somebody asked that question. <laughs> That's an awesome question, <laughs> but uh, you, you guys can you guys know the answer to that. You, guys are, are, you know the answer? All right. All right. You go ahead. Well, I, I think um, there's a whole series of code things we're trying to improve and enhance. One of the paramount things we feel this building should have is to be sprinkled. What happened in the 2002 edition, they used, it, it, it was legal and it was appropriate, but they used a process to get around sprinkling the rest of the building by doing that fire shutter and that roll down curtain that occurs in that walkway space. Well, I don't know if any of you have ever been bought near one of those things when they come down. It's, it, they're not real user friendly. So um, this building at 23,000 square feet, an assembly type area where we have close to 300 people in the building at a time, should be sprinkled. And so what that does is it changes exit codes and everything else dramatically when that uh, facility has been provided with that type of thing. Now, that said, the exiting and distances are all still uh, paramount and important. So all the, the um, code studies in terms of travel distance and <clears throat> things like that, everything we're doing here, we're, we're meeting the new codes and we're trying to exceed it. But right now we're deficient. We're, we're not meeting the code. And um, we, we, we feel that's some liability. I, just as a side note, too, I will tell you that that has been... Both... Um, Safety, you know, in terms of uh, um, fire and sprinkler improvements and, and ADA have been probably the biggest things that I've been focusing on. I mean, I think they already knew that coming into the facility. Some of these things were lacking. But I know being from more, in my profession and what I do for a living, it's been something that's been paramount, making these improvements or at least suggesting some of these improvements through this process. And, and um, they're absolutely right. When you, when you add things like a fire protection system, many things change. You know, ratings that you typically have in corridors for fire ratings go away. Mm -hmm. um, travel distances get extended. All those things are being analyzed as they go through this entire process. Which has been great, and it, uh, and again, I appreciate the question. That's that's an awesome question. So I was pretty. <laughs> One other thing to add is, again, as we talk about specific spaces, um, I've had different people come to me with different ideas of, well, could we do this here? Could we do that here? That's all still on the table. Just because you haven't seen something specifically mentioned or a picture of something doesn't mean that it's not uh, being considered, and we're gonna we're gonna get to that. I'm thinking specifically. Um, we had a, a church member who's very interested in a columbarium, a place for ashes, that this could be a permanent place. Um, and we're, I'm toying with the idea of maybe that would be appropriate on that wall over there as part of uh, a chapel, a uh, fireside room. Anyway, I just wanted to mention that. There are lots and lots of details still to work through. Janice, question. Okay, question. Okay, I'm in a choir, but um, what are you going to do with the organ pipes? Are you doing a different system for the organ? And what section of the building are you going to start first? I can answer some of that. So if you don't already know, I'm going to give away a big secret. Um, the organ pipes don't do anything. They are merely decorative. If you look behind the organ pipes, there are speakers back there because we've had an electronic organ for years. Um, those pipes are left from... <laughs> an organ that, that did use them. Uh, the proposal is, is that that would all be removed as part of opening that wall and having the entrance and, and not having that enclosed feeling over our heads uh, when we walk in. Um, maybe we'll auction them off. Are you looking for a pipe? Oh. Um, um, and where will we start? Excellent question. Um, when you phase things, as they were talking about, Everything you do impacts the next thing. So if you work on one space, you're affecting another space. And do we keep that walled off and not work on it and only work on one spot, or do we try to do it all at once? And that's a huge question that we're going to have to answer. We can do things a bits at a time. The way we ask them to put it together, 
was over 10 years. How would we phase all of these improvements over a 10-year plan? And then we thought about that idea of, do we want our house, this church, to be torn up for 10 years <laughs> and live with construction for that long? Um, could we do it all in a shorter time frame? Um, so those are things that the congregation are going to have to decide uh, by way of funding. Um, and, uh, but we could do some small bits. Um, the plan, our original campaign, was that we would do uh, foyer and sanctuary. We can't do the foyer the way it's planned unless we move the offices. And we can't move the offices unless we build the new offices. And we can't build the new offices. So there you see where we go. Um, we could work on the sanctuary and make those improvements and reorient. That would probably be one of the standalone things that we could do. So. And I'm not sure if I even need the microphone, but uh, I'll tippy-toe around this since we're not discussing this today. First of all, just a great presentation, guys. I really, uh, I was impressed. Um, we keep talking about a 10-year plan. If money was no object, which we know it is, how quickly could those all be implemented and put into uh, operation? Well, even... Two years? Uh, One year? Two to three. Two or three years? Two to three okay. years, yeah, because... Um, even if all, even if it was all let, for instance, in one contract, <clears throat> this would still be done in phases because we can't move out of the house. It's sort of that idea of remodeling your house, and you still got to have a kitchen or bathroom to work. Mm -hmm. So uh, we still need to do this in incremental phases, but it would <clears throat> it would change and accelerate things. It would also make more economies of scale by doing it under you know one or two contracts rather than multiple ones over a long, you know, many years of period. So, but, you know, I, if, if we've got probably three phases of work at uh, six to seven months per phase, per phase, you know, we'd be looking at, you know, probably around a, a two-year. And the only other question I would ask, and this probably more for Kevin and Eric, there have been dollar figures, I'll tip you to it real quickly, you tossed around last year or past years. Should we basically put those out of our mind now? Uh, or are they still numbers that are going to be relatively close to this? The, the original number that we threw out was before we even met these guys. <laughs> so none of the, the original plan that we started two and a half, two years ago, we didn't have this plan built. We were thinking, what if we turned the pews and made the floor nicer and raised that? So we're looking at, at very different and, and new dollar figures. Okay. Yeah. That, that was a limited project scope, if you recall. It, was, it, it, it wasn't a comprehensive facility assessment and master plan. Um, now, obviously, when we started working with these gentlemen, they, they looked at us and said, you, you know, you're going to do, you want to do that project, but you really need to look at your whole facility. So it was actually an enlightening experience for us, and we, we spent, you know, it was, uh, you know, to change, I guess, I don't want to say change your mindset, but we looked at it from a whole different perspective than we ever had done before, and that's only because we actually took the time to do it and have a series of meetings. And we actually had a, a lot of interesting discussions throughout those meetings in order for us to understand that it really isn't just one part or this part. It should look at the whole entire facility. It, it kind of goes back to that <clears throat> book analogy that I used early on in the presentation, was that the previous studies looked at, at chapters 7, 8, and 9, well, by looking at the whole book, chapter six, which maybe is the site work, affects the implementation. Um, looking at circulation and how the office spaces work affects the narthex and how that entrance experience does it. So that's where kind of looking back globally at the whole situation, even though there was certain chapters kind of studied before, the storyline of the chapter changed a little bit because other information from other chapters were added into it and, and changed the direction of the book. And, and, and so this is where we're at right now is trying to sort it out to see that, you know, what can be done and at what level and, and what's the timeline. You know, we know we've got these liabilities that we've uh, assessed through the uh, facility assessment plan that wasn't done before. So we've, we've established about 25 items in the overall church that need to be done right now, irregardless of programming, just because stuff is worn out or has to be redone. 
And so uh, by knowing that knowledge then helps us uh, say, okay, now I can be good stewards of my money because I don't want to be spending money here if I've got liabilities out here that are going to come back and haunt me in a couple of years. You know, ignoring them now doesn't make them go away. So that's why we're trying to, to be holistic in terms of all the possibilities and You kind of touched on what I was just thinking about. Uh, so what is the status of the mechanicals? We know the windows in the um, fellowship hall sound like they are kind of might need some attention soon. What is the status of the mechanicals? We, we've kind of assessed each of the pieces, and it's kind of hard to go into that level of detail in front of all of you, but you know, a simple one is the galvanized piping that services uh, the original part of the 65 building is all corroding and failing. So that not knowledge of knowing that you've got to tear the bathrooms apart to replace the plumbing all of a sudden affects other things to say, well, if I'm going to replace the plumbing anyway, what are other op opportunities? Um, there's other pieces. We've got a couple rooftop uh, mechanical units that have been recently replaced. Others have not. Uh, there's parts of the hydronic system that service the main sanctuary <clears throat> that are buried underneath the floor. You know, those are um, ending, uh, nearing their ends of service life. So we've kind of tried to earmark each of these things in the facility plan in detail to, to say, okay, in the next two years, five years, eight years, these are all things that are going to have to be addressed. We have in, in the big book <laughs> that they made for us, we have every one of those things, the item, the cost, and how far out it needs to be worked on, and I'd be glad to share that. It hasn't been discussed, but I'm assuming that electrical uh, upgrades would be part of the, you the whole process, because when you get into Fellowship Hall and the kitchen, there are some outlets in that kitchen that can't even carry two uh, coffee pots without blowing the circuit. <laughs> Um, I, I think uh, that gets back to the fact that we have a, a building that's been added on to five times over 53 years. And so some pieces are aging in place that have to be replaced anyway. Other pieces are doing things that we've never really intended to do because that wasn't originally built and designed that way. So we've got a multiplicity of things like that and, and electrical, mechanical, plumbing. Those are all core elements that... Um, Unless you're, unless you're an electrician or a plumber, you don't get excited about it, but you, you do get excited about it if it doesn't work or if it breaks. And so that's why we're trying to just uh, make sure that we've got an earmark of all those liabilities going forward. Other questions? How do you control access to the secure area? I mean, you have someone sit there and let people in and out, or how, how does that work? Um, the, 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 main, electric uh, the main thing we do, we create a, a method of egress and circulation so you can use card access and control devices and all the doors. So for instance, the, in the children's area, all those key doors now would have card access with electronic latch releases. So that uh, staff would have uh, card access or proximity readers. Uh, there'd be switches with electric latch releases so somebody at the front desk can open up a door. There'd also be readers out the outside front door. So controlling ingress, egress, ingress and egress out of there from a security standpoint is, is, is really, unfortunately, something that's really important in today's environment. So that's the type, those are the type of devices. And that's this layout then allows so we've got redundant circulation and pathways to have that occur that doesn't create uh, burdensome effects for other, uh, other elements of, of the church inside of it so that can, there can be some standalone autonomy and function for those secure areas and lockdown where other areas are still open. And we've been told by the folks in Children's Weekday who are familiar with state codes and regulations and they get money from different places and have to follow certain things that it's not probably a matter of if, it's a matter of when that's going to be required here. Um, another question that came up uh, along those lines, those same uh, pass cards work with the elevator. So you would, if you got on the elevator from the, the church side, you'd have to have a card to pass through to the other side or, or those, those cards work within the elevator too so that you can't just use the elevator as a way to get through. Just asking for clarification. 
on the children's side. Mm -hmm. I have a grandson that comes to the morning and after school. Grandma comes and gets him sometimes. So you're saying there will be someone, I will have to push a button, they will have to let me in so that I can go in and sign out my grandchild and bring him back out. So you're going to have a full-time staff person sitting at that door from the time it begins at 6 a.m. until it ends at 6 p.m., correct? Or, more inexpensively, every family would get a card that would let them in during a certain time. Maybe. I don't know if that's the same thing. So you're saying um, my daughter would have a card. i got to get the card from her. I don't know. That's, that's I, I, it sound, yeah, you're sounding kind of complicated there, and that's what I'm wondering. I know when I go to Pierce Elementary, I have to buzz in. They open the door. I go in and go do whatever I need to do. So, um, safety, safety does, and security d does have some inconveniences that go along with it. So, you know, we're giving up some, some liberties here whenever we get to the more secure kind of environments, and it's hard to have both things the way it was and then still get security and level. So are there sometimes some inconveniences? Potentially, from an efficiency standpoint, <clears throat> you know, there's different ways that um, staff can remote the entrance in terms of uh, you don't necessarily have to have somebody uh, right there, another staff person. There could be a, a, a chain of command in terms of how those uh, communication instructions go to a teacher or an aide or something else, and they either see it on their computer screen or whatever, because there'd be potentially cameras or other things like that to be able to see the person if someone isn't at that remote area. But bottom line, there is some con inconveniences when you get to this level of security. I but we, I the older kids just walk up by themselves and let themselves in. So you're going to have to deal with them being able to have staff, staff would have to be more attentive to coming and going. And that's part of security. Yeah. Combined. So you're right. It will take more time and more attention. Monitor that as well. Can't argue that. <clears throat> Thank you, folks who need to go. I know this is uh, uh, taking quite a bit of time, and we're... Uh, very glad for everyone's participation, no matter how long you're able to stay. Yes? I have a minor question, but I'm unsure of what this diagonal is to the left of the nursery. Is that because I don't see any bathroom? What about bathroom in the nursery? Uh, there would be plumbing in the nursery. It's just, it's just not drawn in. There'd be a bathroom in that nursery. Can't have a nursery without it. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yes, we would do that. Yes. <laughs> The code closet needs work because you got 200 people coming out of church and you got a double doors to go in and out. So they're going to get congested in that area big time. I understand. Say again. You got double doors going into the coat closet. Oh, okay. And people are going in to get their coats and people are coming out from their coats okay. and it's going to be a congested area. Okay. We could lose a little coat space and open each, side, each end. That's a great point and another detail that has to be worked out. Yeah. Anything else for these gentlemen while we have them here? Kevin and I know this pretty well, too. Um, members of the committees know this pretty well. We're bringing, bringing the pastors along. <laughs> They've got a big learning curve on this one. Anything else you'd like, gentlemen, like to? No, I just like to thank everybody. Uh, thank whenever you do a process like this, it's it's a it's a big endeavor, but it takes it takes everyone to be uh, involved at one level or another. So, um, look forward to trying to see how this parts of the solution can be implemented. Yeah. Thank you. We're going to be following up very soon uh, with a letter. Um, information in the newsletter that's coming out soon. Uh, we're going to start putting. Uh, the dollar amounts on things as we finalize that, we're, we're very close. Um, and, and we're going to share everything there is to share. You will be able to find out everything you want to find out. Because it's all going to be out there. Thank you all so much for your time today. Appreciate it very much. <laughs>